All right, we are about to get started. For all the people who are outside, let me also tell you that the air condition has been switched off for some time and now you can be seated. But do understand that we will have to switch it on again after some time, otherwise it gets suffocating as well. We've, as you can see, Professor Sir Arul Kumaran has, uh, is very active and he's already on the podium. So he has got a few slides that he would like to finish from the old presentation and then he would like to get started. So I request all of you to please be seated, the ones who are standing. Again, we are about to get started. All the ones who are still having tea and coffee, you can get your tea cups and get inside as well. I need to ask the audience, do you think we should get started? Yes. Okay. okay. So I'm going to go through the last three slides because I think that's quite important. Now the, the three slides I'm going to show you has the same baseline rate, no accelerations, but different types of deceleration. So this one, as you could see, 170. And if you draw the line, from the beginning of the contraction, straight line, it decelerates immediately. So these are atypical variable. The next one, again, like late deceleration, the variability is going, and this one, the variability is completely gone. So this is the bad trace out of the three, because the variability is the last thing to go off, the autonomic nervous system. So this baby needs to be delivered this baby maybe could stand for another 60 minutes. This baby can stand even longer because the variability is maintained. So although the decelerations appear worse, what really matters is the variability with the decelerations. So I showed you this picture. So you have to make a clinical decision making. So this mother is 41 weeks and three days. She is in early labor. As you could see, she's contracting one in eight. The Acceleration is absent, there is a tachycardia 165, and these are atypical variables. So all the features are wrong, heart rate, variability, and the decelerations. So this baby needs delivery. If it is only one feature which is abnormal, like if the heart rate was at 140, the variability is good and decelerations were the same, then you can observe. If two features, then you have to test the baby by stimulating or by doing an FBS, but all three, then you have to do a delivery. The next one is she's six centimeters, not on oxytocin, but has tachycardia 180, hardly any variability. So this baby also will run into trouble very soon. So absent variability is something which you have to be very worried about. So FIGO has come out with some classification, which even the UK, we are trying to follow the same. If it is normal, the heart rate is 110 to 160, variability is 5 to 25, deceleration is not repetitive, so that means occasional decelerations you don't have to worry, and no intervention is necessary to improve fetal well-being. Suspicious mean at one feature, at least one characteristic of normality is lacking. So either the baseline rate is high or variability is reduced or more than 25, and um, repetitive decelerations are coming. And there's a low probability of hypoxia. So if it is only one feature abnormal, low probability, so you have to correct action by putting on the side and hydrating and monitoring and so on. 
But pathological means the heart rate is abnormal, the variability is either increased or reduced, and there are repetitive late or prolonged deceleration. Once it is repetitive and more of these features, then there is a high degree of hypoxia acidosis. Then you take the corrective actions, and if it is not working, then you have to think about delivery. So the idea is actually one feature is abnormal, observe. Two features, you have to think about doing something. If it doesn't improve, you have to deliver. So I won't go through the nice guidelines. It is almost same, but I like to summarize what we have discussed up to now. Accelerations and normal variability are hallmark of fetal health. That means they are somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system is working well. Periods of decreased variability may represent fetal sleep. So that means it can accelerate, then go to sleep, accelerate, go to sleep. Hypoxic fetus may have a normal baseline rate with no accelerations and reduced variability for more than 40 minutes. So you have to be worried about reduced variability. But if the contractions are coming, then you just observe whether there are decelerations or not. If there are no decelerations with the contractions, you can wait for a longer period. And in the presence of reduced variability, less than five, shallow decelerations less than 15 are ominous in a non-reactive trace. This is the one I said is exception to the rule. If it is a very tiny deceleration with absent variability. Abruption, cord prolapse, and scar rupture can give rise to acute hypoxia and should be suspected clinically. Hypoxia and acidosis may develop faster with an abnormal trace in a patient with scanty thick meconium, IUGR, infection, pyrexia, and who are pre or post term. This is one of the slides I showed you earlier as clinical pictures. And in a preterm baby, hypoxia and acidosis can aggravate RDS and contribute to intraventricular hemorrhage and sequelae warranting early action. So if it is preterm, don't wait for too long because the baby gets hypoxia and acidosis, the baby can run into trouble, so you have to deliver as early as possible. Hypoxia can be worsened by oxytocin, epidural, and difficult operative deliveries, which we discussed earlier on, because epidural, especially the late first stage, second stage, if you ask the mother to bend down, it might compress the uterine vessels. During labor, if decelerations are absent, asphyxia is unlikely. So if the trace is abnormal without decelerations, then you must look for other reasons why it is abnormal, like fetal anomaly, drugs, infection, not only hypoxia, because the CTG can be abnormal due to other reasons as well. So I'm going to concentrate on two small areas which, is, uh, which causes confusion in terms of management. That is, when the heart rate drops to less than 80 beats for more than three minutes, in the United States, they call it prolonged bradycardia, high ET beats. But in the UK, we call it prolonged deceleration. So in the textbooks, they might use one of the two terms. Now, in 50% or more of these prolonged decelerations, we don't know what is the cause for it. But what you have to be interested or be careful is whether the prolonged deceleration is due to scar rupture, cord prolapse, or abruptio placente, because scar rupture, cord prolapse, and abruptio placente, what we call as irreversible bradycardia. So you have to take action, otherwise the baby will run into trouble. And there are reversible causes for prolonged bradycardia, like maternal hypotension, either due to epidural top-up or hypotension, abnormal uterine activity, hyperstimulation, an amniotomy, like vaginal examination, sometimes you might stimulate the uterine contraction and there could be bradycardia, but these are reversible. You put on the side and it should be okay. So when you see a prolonged bradycardia, first thing you have to rush and do is actually exclude scar rupture, abruption, and cord prolapse. After that, you can play around with time. The second thing you have to do after excluding scar rupture, abruption, and cord prolapse is to look at the CTG trace and see whether, see whether you see the trace to be reactive at the beginning. Because the trace is not reactive at the beginning, then the baby might be already hypoxic. So you can